네, 안녕하세요. <웃음> 안녕하세요. 아직 안 계신 분도 계시긴 한데 그래요. 지금 아, 지금 예. 지금 옥스퍼드에서 오신 닥터 안드레 헥터 씨가 그 옥스퍼드 대학교에 대해서 좀 얘기를 해 드리고요. 그다음에 옥스퍼드 대학교 하면 사실 칼리지로 굉장히 좀 많은 칼리지가 있는 걸로 알려져 있거든요. 서른 아홉 개 정도. 그래서 많은 학생들이 옥스퍼드 대학교 지원하고 나서 칼리지는 또 뭐지? 왜 여기를 지원해야 되지? 왜 이렇게 생각하는 사람 많거든요. 그래서 그거에 대해서 좀더 얘기를 해드릴 거고요. 굉장히 좀 독특한 문화거든요. 그래서 설명해 드리고요. 그 다음에 대학교 옥스퍼드 들어가려고 하면 옥스퍼드나 캠브리지 들어가려면 그 아티튜드 테스트, 입학 테스트가 있거든요. 그래서 의대 다니는 학생들은 육회, 비맥 같은 왜 이런 테스트를 좀 봐야 되거든요. 그래서 그 테스트에 대해서 좀 알려주려고 하거든요. 그리고 내용 자체가 어쩌면 어려울 수도 있긴 한, 하지만 프리젠테이션으로 좀 설명을 해드릴 거고, 그 다음에 리서치라든지 본인 소개라든지 이런 거 있는데 좀 전문 용어가 좀 나오거든요. 그래서 이 부분은 아 이부 이렇게. 그죠? 리서치를 하고 있다라고 이해를 하시면 충분할 거예요. 그리고 나서 대학을 소개해주고 그죠? 하시면 될것 같고요. 그래요. 좀 재미있길 바라고요. 그 다음에 끝나고 나서 질문 있으시면 좀 질문을 해주시면 될것 같고요. 그리고 저는 끝나고 나서 제가 정리할 수 있는 것은 조금 최대한 좀 정리해서 간단히 좀 소개해드리겠습니다. 네, 감사합니다. Hi, okay, thank you very much. Um... Okay, perfect. So let me just check that this works. Yes. Okay, great. So hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Andre Hector. Um, it's lovely to be here in Seoul and South Korea and to have a chance to speak to you all today. So thank you very much for coming out today. I understand it's a, it's a national holiday. So I really appreciate you all giving up your time to, to be here. And I hope that this talk will be at least a little bit interesting and somewhat informative. Um, so my talk today, I will be telling you a little bit about uh, admissions to Oxford University and in particular focusing on choosing a college, giving you a little bit of information about the collegiate system at Oxford and admissions preparation. Um, so I've structured my presentation in the following way. I'll quickly introduce myself, tell you a little bit about my research um, and my educational background before that. Then we'll talk about the structure and overview of the university. And then we'll look at um, undergraduate courses, which is the topic I imagine a lot of you or a lot of the students in the audience will be interested in um, before moving on to some admission preparation advice and a general sort of look at how that's done uh, before looking at a little bit about the student life, what it's like to study and live in Oxford. And then I will summarize everything at the end. So my current research is um, I'm currently a postdoc in, um, in radio astronomy. I'm part of the experimental radio cosmology group at the University of Oxford, and we're developing the uh, band five receiver of the Square Kilometer Array Telescope, uh, or the SKA. Now, the SKA is one of these, you know, next generation uh, observational facilities, which alongside things like the James Webb Space Telescope, which you may have heard about recently, uh, the, which is the progenit uh, successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, but focusing on infrared, uh, infrared wavelengths rather than optical. Um, you know, you have things like the EELT, which is going to be coming online, the European Extremely Large Telescope in the optical um, wavelengths. And the SKA, together with those other facilities, will really be able to complement the other observatories to give a nice, um, you know, an interesting new look at our universe and at, at, at things that are going on in space. So the Square Kilometer Array, it's an intergovernmental international project that's actually being built and developed across two continents at the moment. There's the low frequency side of it that's being built in Australia and the stuff that I'm working on, that's going to be uh, built in the Karoo Desert in South Africa. And the reason, uh, the reason this, this facility is built in effectively in, in a desert to some extent uh, is twofold. One, it's because, you know, uh, deserts are generally very dry places, and this is good because water vapor in the atmosphere actually attenuates the signals that are coming in, and so building telescopes in, in dry locations actually increases the amount of signal that can get through the atmosphere. And the other reason is that because we're focusing on radio uh, frequencies, um, 
satellite interference actually is a bit of a problem uh, in certain areas. So by building the telescopes in fairly remote locations, you actually minimize uh, the effect of you know, passing satellites interfering with your signal and blocking the stuff that you're really interested in observing. So uh, the reason it's called the Square Kilometer Array is because it's actually an interferometer type telescope. So instead of having one very big single dish, uh, it's split up into lots and lots of little smaller dishes because this is, from a practical point of view, this is easier to construct and put together. And so, uh, but once you add up all the, diff all the areas of all the different observing elements, you get to a total collecting area of about a square kilometer, which is massive in size and is going to make the SKA one of the most sensitive, um, you know, radio telescopes that's ever been produced. Uh, and one of the one sort of you know fun bit of trivia or fun fact is that by the time it goes online and starts taking data, it will actually in one day be collecting as much data as there is on the whole of the internet combined, just to give you a sense of the scale of the operation. And in fact, there are in, you know currently PhD projects taking place um, with regards to how to process that data because again, nobody really knows how to you know how to make sense of such a large volume of data. Coming into, your, coming into your observatory on a daily basis. So the first light is projected to be in 2027, so it's currently under construction, and the instrumental side of it is being developed. And this, I thought this was a really interesting image and a really nice image to use to, to show you one of the you know, prototype dishes. This is actually from the Meerkat telescope, which is a, uh, a progenitor, if you like, a, a kind of a proof of concept for the SKA. And you can see this, this sort of circular plate here. This is actually what's known as the indexer, and that's where all the instruments that are being developed, not just by our group, but by lots of other um, you know, research groups across the world. This is where all the instruments are going to sit, which are gonna you know, actually collect the light as it's you know, reflected from the primary mirror, the secondary mirror, and being brought into focus here. So that's what I've got on the next slide is essentially this photo here, which shows the, the current prototype receiver that we've developed in Oxford. And you can see that it's got, uh, it's, we've, we've actually left it on the roof um, over Christmas. I'll, I'll explain why in, in a minute. But you, you, the, the receiver is split into two subbands. So you've got this, these podules here. Um, they're you know, band 5A and band 5B. And so this entire box is going to live on this circular dish here, and depending on what frequency you want to observe in or, or which subband you want to observe in, then each one of these podules will be brought into the focus of the, of the dish. Um, so what this, what this instrument does is it takes the incident signal from the sky and amplifies it in both subbands by about 60 dB. So we generally use a logarithmic scale. I think it's a multiplication factor of around a million. Um, and also, it uh, it filters it filters the, the the signal into the frequency bands that we are interested in. So I think that's about 4.6 to 15.4 gigahertz. Um, in addition, the whole the whole system is cryogenically cooled uh, to around uh, and and stabilized to around 15 Kelvin or 15 degrees above absolute zero in temperature. Equivalently, I think that's about minus 258 degrees C. And this is to reduce thermal noise and to improve the signal to noise ratio of the uh, of the incoming signal and the the effect that this has is that this this essentially means that you get you know it's it has the same effect as building about three or four additional dishes um, but it's a little bit it's a little bit more practical and actually a little bit more cost effective to just cool the receiver down instead of constructing you know four more observing elements so we're currently building with this, this prototype that you've, that you've got here, that you've got uh, on the picture. That's our first one that we, that we built. We were doing some noise temperature or sensitivity measurements on the roof of the physics department. And we're currently in the process of building a few more, a few more such receivers before taking them out to uh, South Africa, where, we'll be, where we will be doing a little bit of on-dish testing to make sure that everything actually works as expected and that we can do interferometry with the instrument. And so, like I said, we left this one cooling over Christmas uh, while we were monitoring all the different physical properties inside the, the receiver, such as you know, the temperature, temperature stability, and things like the pressure, just to make sure that everything was within the bounds that we expect. Um, 
So before that, uh, I did my PhD in Oxford. I, was, um, I did a PhD in astrophysics. Uh, I was part of the Queen's College, and my, my research topic focused on um, new detection methods uh, for submillimeter wavelength astronomy. That's basically high radio frequency. I don't have too much time to explain in detail what it was about, but if you are interested, I'll be around after the talk, so please do come and have a chat with me then. In addition to that, I was involved in a little bit of undergraduate teaching, uh, mainly focusing on third-year computing for astrophysics course, where you know I would be helping students deal with topical problems in astronomy, such as you know they'd be given data for a uh, for a star planet system, and the light curve would have a dip in it when the planet went in front of the uh, uh, its host star, and from that data you could estimate and infer things like the orbital period of the planet going in front of the star and things like the relative size of the planet to the star as well as uh, an estimate of its mass and its density. And this is actually the way that modern um, research in exoplanets is done to some extent in order to look for things like planets within habitable zones of their uh, stars and to look for you know, ex uh, you know, exoplanets which could potentially um, have life on them. And then before that, I did my undergraduate at Royal Holloway, which is, like I mentioned earlier, uh, part of the University of London, where I did a four-year integrated master's in physics, um, mainly with a focus on astronomy modules, because that's something that I've always been interested in and I found fascinating. So I was very lucky to be able to do a degree um, specializing in that. Okay, so a quick overview about Oxford. Um, so. Its, its exact foundation date is, um, is not very well known, but there's evidence of teaching at Oxford dating back as far as 1096 or 11th century. I couldn't find the exact reference for this, um, so when I, you know, I just did a little bit of research when I was making these slides, and so 1096 seems to be like, like the, the date that pops up everywhere. It actually grew rapidly from about 1167, uh, when Henry II, who was then King of England, he, uh, he, he had an argument with uh, Thomas Beckett, who was then the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, um, over you know, a, a topic like the rights enjoyed, the rights and freedoms enjoyed by the church. And the outcome of this argument was that English students got the, got the, got the, got the blame, and uh, they were banned from attending the University of Paris in France. The effect that this had is that you know, Oxford actually grew from all this, and between 1249 and 1264, that's where the first colleges were established. The three oldest ones being University, Balliol, and Merton, with some dispute as to which one is actually the oldest. So between them, they're known as the three oldest, and they were all founded between 1249 and 1264. Skipping forward about 800 years, uh, today uh, Oxford is a modern collegiate uh, research university, and what that means is that there isn't a certain place in Oxford, which is, you know, the University of Oxford, because all of the academic departments and all of the buildings are actually intertwined with all the, you know, town buildings. And so it's all, it's all the university is all dotted around the city, if you like. And uh, it's made up of uh, colleges, which are essentially um, financially independent and semi-autonomous groups of people, so they consist of a, a provost or a master, and then a body of academics, and then a body of graduate students and a body of undergraduate students. So it's, a, it's a, essentially a college as a community of people who you know, strive for academic pursuits, um, and that's complemented by academic faculties or departments which specialize in research in a particular topic. So you might have like the Department of Engineering, which focuses on engineering, or you know, the Department of Computer Science, which focuses on computer science, and then there'll be colleges where academics study those things at those colleges. In addition, there are permanent private halls, which are very similar to colleges, except I believe that uh, part of their funding comes from a, um, you know, a, a religious body, so like a, a, a church or a parish, but to, to a large extent, they're, they're the same as colleges. Uh, the departments themselves then make up four divisions. So you've got the humanities division, the medical sciences, mathematical, physical, and life sciences, life sciences division, or MPLS, and you have social sciences. And so the departments and all the colleges together combined uh, make up what's collectively known as the university. And so the final thing to note 
is that it's actually the college or the permanent private hall that awards degrees to students on behalf of the university. So students, when they're enrolled on a program or a course at the University of Oxford, generally need to have a college associated with them because it will be that college that then gives them their degree. So a few quick facts and figures about Oxford. Um, as of December 2021, there are 26,000 students at Oxford with uh, about 12, 12,500 undergrads and just over 13,400 postgraduate students. 23% of the undergraduates and about 65% of postgraduates are international students. Uh, and in total, international students make up around 44% of the overall student body or almost 11,500 students. So you can see that the international community plays a big part to the, student, to the overall student body at Oxford. Um, in addition to this, Oxford has one of the lowest dropout rates in the whole of the UK with, you know, for the academic year of entry of 2019 to 2020, only 0.9% of Oxford students dropping out, which is, you know, very low uh, compared to the significantly higher UK average of 5.3%. And finally, um, over 91% of Oxford graduates are employed or in further uh, study six months after graduating, which is another fantastic statistic. And so this picture here, you know, I thought I thought was quite quite a nice one to include because this is actually Turl Street in Oxford, which is usually very very busy and full of hustle and bustle, and there's you know cars and bicycles and pedestrians walking around. But I actually took this during the first lockdown when I was when I was out for one of my 30 minute allotted allotted exercise um, windows, and it was completely deserted. And I thought that this was interesting to show you the contrast between, you know, the 26,000 students that there are normally in Oxford and it being completely empty during the lockdowns. So let's talk a little bit about undergraduate admissions. So I'm sure it'll come as no surprise to anyone that uh, undergraduate course entry is, is quite competitive at Oxford, and there are only about 3,300 available places each year with over 24,000 uh, potential applicants who applied, for instance, at the start of 2021. This means that Oxford gets more than seven applications for every available undergraduate space going. And the result of this, once you know, those 24,000 have been shortlisted for interview, is that you know, the university ends up conducting about 20,000 interviews with around 10,000 applicants in a very, very busy two-week interview period in December. So the question is, what is the best way to ma maximize your chances of getting a place? Um, I'll just wait for people to take a photo. <laughs> um, okay, so the very first thing to do is you know, to choose a subject. And the important thing here is to make sure you choose something that you enjoy because, you know, it's, it's, you're going to be doing this for a, for a fairly long amount of time. You're going to be studying this for at least generally three years if you go for a bachelor's. So make sure it's something that you like and that you want to study for at least, at least three years of your life. But that in mind, don't just pick something that you like, like for instance, music, if you don't know the difference between your treble clef and your bass clef, because, you know, you have to be a bit competent and you know, re reasonably good at your chosen subject in order to have a chance of, of getting a place. Um, next, you want to find out which colleges actually offer a degree in your, in your chosen subject because not all colleges will cater for every subject. So for instance, the, some of the permanent private halls will spe specialize in things like theology and more religious focused degrees and they might not do certain things like you know, engineering. Um, but once you've, once you've picked a subject and you've done a little bit of research on different colleges, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, um, you pick a college that offers the subject you wish to study and you will generally apply for a degree for a course at that college. The best way to uh, pick a college is to actually go to o open days because most colleges will, will have these for their prospective students, I think generally sometime in late June and there's another window in early September. Uh, and some colleges will even offer virtual open days because I realize that I'm giving this talk and saying that the best thing to do when choosing a college is to go to an open day, but people being based in South Korea might find it difficult to go to all the way to the UK for an open day. So some colleges, I believe University and Trinity in particular, have what they call um, open days in virtual format, which they did when um, 
you know, the whole country was in lockdown and some of that material is still available online. So it's a very good resource to have a look at and just get a general feel for the college. And also you can read the college prospectus. Um, most colleges will have this online and this is a really good tool to, that gives you an overview of the college, you know, the various facilities that it provides and, you know, kind of a little bit more about the history and the feel of, of every particular college. So a few things to think about and to consider when, when you come to choosing a college. The first one is accommodation because, you know, you're, you're likely to be living away from home for the first, for the first time, um, you know, for the students. And I believe that all colleges will offer accommodation uh, for students in their first year of study. Some of the bigger ones will generally offer accommodation for the whole duration of the degree, but this is, this is not the case for all colleges. So if, you like, if you're somebody who likes a more structured approach to a uh, university, it might be good to, to aim for a college that offers accommodation for the duration of the degree, whereas if you're somebody who wants a bit more independence, you want to live out with your friends, for example, then it might be a good idea to you know, look for a college where you can live outside of the college for your second and third years, for example. Next on the list is study space. This is very important because you're going to be spending a lot of your time writing essays, doing problem sheets, various assignments, that sort of thing. And I believe all colleges will have a library, but some of them, you know, if you're like myself, I don't really like working in a library because it's all very quiet and you're, you're almost too scared to move. Uh, I prefer a much more, you know, a slightly more informal place to work, like a cafe, something like that, where I can, for instance, listen to music. Um, so some colleges will have a variety of study spaces, you know, little common rooms and things like that, maybe computer rooms. So do a little bit of research and, and, and you know, think about what study space and what facilities the, the college provides. Next is social life. This is very important because, you know, your, your college will essentially be your, your home away from home. And some colleges, especially the undergraduate student bodies, will provide lots of events for their undergraduate students. So these are things like, you know, movie nights, um, you know, uh, various walks around the city, maybe trips to the cinema, things like that. And some are definitely a little bit more vibrant than others. So make sure there's a good balance of, you know, extracurricular and social activities as well. Um, size and number of students, again, this is, this is another one to consider because I think that some of the bigger colleges have around 900 students, including undergrads and postgrads. And if you're somebody who likes being part of a, you know, big and vibrant community, then you may wish to apply to a larger college. Whereas I think some of the smaller colleges has, have as few as 300 students. So if you prefer a smaller, more intimate, more cozy environment, then a smaller college might be right for you. Just for reference, I was um, at Queen's College, which is a photo of the front quad here. And I believe that's a, that's a medium-sized college of about 500 students. Uh, gym and sports facilities. Again, if you're somebody who's very sporty or who enjoys taking part in things like, you know, um, physical activities, then this is, this is one to consider because there is, a, there is a gym that's open to all members of the university at, um, down at Ifley Road, but this is generally very oversubscribed and it can get busy. And some colleges have really, really good gyms, which generally aren't super crowded and you can go and get a workout in every, any time you want. And, um, you know, you also have various things like, you know, football clubs, rugby clubs, boat clubs, various sports that the colleges have, and they all compete against each other in, in all these various things. So you might wish to, you know, think about your college from the point of view of the sporting facilities as well. Catering. So again, every, every college will have a dining hall and it will serve sort of breakfast, lunch and dinner, but you might be at sport practice one day and you may miss the dinner slot. So you might want to think, you know, do I have a kitchen where I can cook some food? Or you might be really into cooking. Does my college come with a kitchen or does the, does the accommodation provide catering facilities? Uh, so I, I believe I'm right in saying that on the main site, Queen's doesn't really provide um, kitchens or anything that's, you know, any ways of making a fire because it actually burnt down in the late 1600s and then they rebuilt it and ever since then they've been very very careful about any fires taking place in the future. Uh, proximity to town and your department so this is another good one. 
like I mentioned before, you'll be studying um, you'll be studying in your department for most of the time, and then you'll be working in your college. So there's going to be a lot of moving, you know, back and forth from your college to your department, and vice versa. So, for example, uh, if you were to study engineering, the uh, one of the colleges that's really nearby is Keeble, and that always gets a, a large app a large number of applicants going there for or applying there to do engineering because it's a two minute walk from the engineering department. So think a little bit about you know where you want to study and how far away, or what you want to study and how far away is your college from your department. But the other thing, you know, the other thing to mention is don't overthink it. You might still end up anywhere. Um, most courses will offer you, um, will give you an interview at um, two colleges. So you might end up having an interview at your first you know, first choice college, and then a second random college. And it could be that you end up either at that one, or you could even end up at one that you never applied to and never interviewed at. It all depends, like, you know, how in that particular year, how many students apply to each college and which ones are oversubscribed and which ones are not. And then the final point is, you know, again, don't, don't, don't overthink it because ultimately all the colleges have more in common than, they, than, than what sort of divides them and differentiates them. And in my experience, um, most students end up really liking whichever college they end up at because that's kind of like your family away from home and you, you become part of that, that college's community and that college's life. And even if they didn't apply there, they generally really, really like that college which, wherever they end up. Okay, so a little bit how much, just gonna check how I'm doing for time. Um, okay, so. Yeah, so 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 let's um, let's have a let's have a very quick chat about the personal statement. So this is this is one of the supporting documents that you will need to um, submit along with your application. And this is essentially like a cover letter that says why do you want to study a particular subject. Best thing to do when you're writing your personal statement is to just be honest about your interests. And if you're not completely sure what your interests are yet, which is completely natural and normal, then take a little bit of time to think about them. Maybe do a little bit of exploring, do work experience in a, you know, in that in the area that you want to or that you're thinking about studying to try and discover what you're good at, what you like, what you don't like. And it's definitely good to do this before you apply, so that you're not trying to do all this in a in a bit of a last minute rush and a last minute panic. Also, in your personal statement, don't just focus on what you enjoy, but also try and say why you enjoy it. You know, don't just say I enjoy maths or you know I enjoy physics. Try and give examples of you know when you've done maths and why why you find it fascinating, or why you find it interesting, or whatever subject you're applying for. In addition to that, you, it would be very good to include any notable extracurricular activities because these will essentially you know back up your interests and and enhance your application. Uh, but try to focus on things that are relevant to the application to the subject that you're applying for. So, for example, if you are if you're applying to do maths. Maybe you've taken part in a maths Olympiad, put that in. Um, you know, equally, if you're applying for something like English literature, maybe you've taken part in essay competitions, put that down. Um, you know, and these are all generally good sort of extracurricular or supercurricular activities um, related to your subject, which are very good to put in. And most importantly, be able to evidence or show evidence of any claims that you make. So uh, a classic example is, you know, Engineering applicants will quite often say that they're, you know, in influenced and inspired by the works of Isambard Kingdom Brunel. And then they get to the interview stage, and the interviewer will ask them, "Oh, okay, you've said you're inspired by uh, Brunel to study engineering. Can you give two examples of his work?" Everyone always names the Clifton Suspension Bridge, but they get a little bit caught out when trying to think of the second one. So the point here is, you know, do a little bit more than just a very, very surface level basic research and, you know, really know your stuff when you go for the interview. Um, okay, so aptitude tests. Uh, this is five minutes. Yeah. So very, very quickly on aptitude tests. So these are essentially like entrance exams, um, which all all pretty much all students that want to study a, a degree at Oxford will have to take. And some of them, like, you know, the uh, applicants for law and applicants for medicine will generally have to take an admissions test, um, you know, irrespective of whether they go to Oxford or Cambridge, but at all universities in the UK. Best thing to do is to get familiar with the format and content. And for this, there's a lot of past papers 
and a lot of material online. Generally speaking, try to learn the syllabus. This is generally AS and GCSE, but some topics will not be covered, and especially the questions towards the end will be more advanced. Best, best advice I think I can give is to try doing the questions and try doing these questions under timed conditions. In addition to that, start prep as early as possible. Ideally, as soon as you know what it is you want to do for your subject. And so the other thing to remember is that this is fundamentally a skill that can be practiced and refined to kind of fine tune your problem solving skills because a lot of the stuff that you'll see on there might not be stuff that you've you know, encountered before. So it's not really a fixed curriculum with recommended textbooks and so, on, so forth. Um, we won't have time to go through the examples, which some of you <laughs> may, be, <laughs> may be very happy about. But so, you know, once you've got through the aptitude test, you'll get to the interview stage, which will likely, um, and you'll likely have two interviews at two different colleges. Think of the interview as a mini tutorial. The interviewers often won't want to see what you already know, but rather how teachable you are. And so to that extent, you know, they'll want you to speak through your thought process when you're answering whatever questions you, you may have. And so the best thing to do here is to just think about, think, you know, speak your, pro, speak your thought process out loud and don't worry about making mistakes or saying anything that's wrong. The worst thing you could do is just freeze up and not say anything. Um, and, you know, the interviewers will generally guide you through the process. They're not going to be admissions tutors like your admissions tutors from, you know, UCAS or something. They're going to be actual fellows or researchers in that field, and they'll have had lots of experience guiding students through their interviews. And the, it, the general format is that it will start with something that's quite simple, and it will develop and develop and develop up to a point that's, you know, beyond something that you or the student will know. And the final thing to do is to practice, you know, um, get your teachers to try and run through some mock style um, Oxford or Cambridge interview questions with you just to get a feel for doing those things and thinking under, under a little bit of external pressure. So student life, basically one of the very final slides if we have time for. Okay, um, so Oxford terms are, are very, very short. There are only eight weeks, when, which is very intense compared to most universities in the UK, which are around 12 weeks. Um, the students will generally live in college in their first year, where they get things like their accommodation, their food, social activities, and that's where they'll have tutorials, which when they get an assignment, they'll go back to college and practice it or have a go at it. And then they'll have a small group of other students also studying that course, We'll have like a one-hour tutorial, which is essentially a small mini class where they can cover any topics that they weren't sure about or anything that they didn't understand. And the other nice thing about this, the, you know, the collegiate system is that because there will only be a few students studying the same course as you in your year, it's a really good opportunity to meet people and get to know people from other courses. Um, and yeah, I think we mentioned that the lectures and practicals generally will take place in the department. So the other nice thing about the student life is the, you know, the wealth of extracurricular activities that students can take part in. There's, and there's things both at the college level and at the university level. So the college level will be stuff like the JCR and MCR committee. JCR is the junior common room, so that's the, you know, body of undergraduates. The MCR is the middle common room, which is the graduate student body at every college. These both have committees run by students where they you know, have a small budget and they organize events for their college. So one year I was um, the welfare officer in my, in my MCR and I did things like, you know, did fortnightly like tea and cake events where students could come, talk about any issues they were having, enjoy some snacks, just hang out and I'd you know, try and be available and accessible to talk to them about anything that might be bothering them at the time and work through those issues. Um, in addition, you have sports. So like I mentioned uh, during the forum, most colleges will have a boat club, which you know makes rowing very accessible. Not that I'm pushing the rowing agenda at all. It was just something that came to mind to talk to you about when I was making these slides. And in addition to that, there's lots of musical societies. Most colleges will have a choir. And you know there's plenty of other university-wide societies, clubs that you can get involved with. Everything from bell ringing, Quidditch, to blues level sport. So basically the advice is to find something that you might like and just get stuck in. And so to summarize, 
Um, it's, you know, studying at Oxford is quite competitive and fairly intense. To maximize the chances of getting a place, really think carefully about what you wish to study and then prepare your application and practice, you know, practice the um, admissions tests, practice the interviews. Don't panic in the interview and finally try to enjoy it. And on that note, I think I will leave and say thank you very much and I will take questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. 그 그래요. 다음 분은 그 캠브리지에서 오신 그 알리슨 아, 알리슨 이런 분인데 그 주개를 준비했거든요. 자기 소개서에 대한 준비. 이게 이제 저희 학생들한테는 좀더 맞을 것 같긴 해요 지금. 그리고 하나는 왜 리서치가 중요하냐라는 질문인데 그 주제인데 어, 어떤 게 좋으실 것 같으세요? 첫분 당연히 제가 그죠 <웃음> 리서치 부분은 사실 제가 이, 이해하기 힘든 부분 좀 있고 그 다음에 제가 리서치 부분은 혹시 저한테 개인적으로 물어보면 제가 좀더 쉽게 좀 설명을 좀 해드릴게요 그리고 제 학생들한테는 굉장히 상담을 하면서 이 부분을 제가 지금 많이 강조하거든요 그래서 오늘은 그것보다도 모든 사람들에게 관심 있는 퍼스널 스테이트먼트에 대해서 좀 얘기를 좀 깊게 좀 해볼게요 방금 그 얘기를 했지만 좀 짧게 했고 그 다음에 이분은 좀 그죠 캠브리지에 대해서도 얘기를 해드리고 그 다음에 그 자기 속에서 대해서 얘기해 드리고 그렇게 할 겁니다. 네. 오케이. So we doing this one? Yeah. 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 The other, <laughs> the other one. <laughs> so we're not going to talk about this. We're going to talk about personal statement personal instead. Statement. I apologize. There's a lot of listening. I hope this is proving interesting and useful. And then we'll have time for questions if, if you wish um, later on. Okay. Take two. <laughs> All right. So... Personal statement and how to advance your portfolio. So my um, discipline, my domain uh, is education. So I will be talking about this influenced by that stance, but a lot of what I say will be more widely um, applicable. So the, the purpose of your personal statement in, then is to promote you. This is the opportunity, the first opportunity you've got for people who, who are reading this to really get a sense of who you are and what you can offer. Um, so you want to put your strengths forward in that. And Andre mentioned this a little bit. You, you want to show your interest in a subject. The, the readers want to see that you are interested to study something, but they, they want to see more than that. They want to see that you've got some understanding as a foundational basis on which to develop in, in those university places. And it's also important that I, I've used the word um, show your interest rather than tell the reader about your interests. There, there is a difference um, between saying I am interested in and saying I have engaged in X, Y and Z, I have participated and I've followed up on something which shows you've acted on your interests rather than just something interests you. It's active rather than what might be considered passive. And state why you're interested, so that it's believable, it's more convincing. It's also important through this to show your independence of thought. Um, when, you, when you go to these universities, you will be doing, you will have lectures, you will have seminars and supervisions, but a lot of it is independently following up on, on ideas, um, wider reading and showing initiative that you can study things and it's again acting on that interest. So independence to pursue those academic interests is really important. But doing that also enables you to evidence that you are aware of and you've got access to the academic discourses related to your topic of study. So that might be, what I mean by that is things like 
reading journal articles and showing that you understand some of the debates that are going on in your course of study. If you can comment on something that you found interesting that's relevant in your topic at the moment, some reading you've done around it, um, and why that's interesting to you, it shows you're aware of the conversations and the topics that are relevant in your discipline. So it's important, it may be stating the obvious, to highlight your academic strengths. Of course, strong grades are important in, in such statements, um, but very much making sure that those strengths that you identify are related to the course of study that you're applying for. Within this, you can highlight experiences and interests that, interests that are related to these strengths. So um, if you've engaged in some, um, taken part in committees or volunteered for something that's related to, to your study, this, the supercurricular super curricular element, that's important to show as it, it's, it shows the wider picture and again shows that independent pursuit. But, um, but do keep your academic focus as the main, the dominant space that you offer. I think within the 4,000 character count that you've got, um, a rough ballpark is sort of 75% should be academic focus, 25% more extracurricular. So do keep that in, in mind as you're thinking about that. Um, and when you're, when you're talking about these experiences and interests, think about the skills that you've developed through those. So it's, again, this showing engagement rather than just interest. So if you've engaged in these different activities, what skills have you developed? Maybe things like teamwork, communication, problem solving, creativity, that, that are those sort of study skills that um, people will be looking for as well. So ultimately, this is a space for you to identify why you're a good fit. Um, for the university, for the course that you're applying for. I appreciate within that that, um, as Yasmin says, you, you'll be applying for six, five courses, five universities. So it needs to be sort of general enough that all of those institutions can feel that you're writing to them whilst being specific enough um, that equally people can feel that you're not ruling them out in your application. So there's a broad structure that, that is probably useful to follow um, when you're writing these things. Um, you will probably write your opener and close last because they need to be really powerful. It's a cliche, but first and last impressions do count. You want to hook your reader in and grab their attention. They're probably reading an awful lot of these statements and they will give them their attention but you want to stand out. So that first sentence or first couple of sentences is really important and your powerful conclusion at the end to really not repeat, but to summarize some strengths and end on a powerful note, leave a good impression at the end are really important. So then the main body um, of your statement should again show that passion for the academic study, show you've engaged, show you've got some understanding of the discipline, not just interest, and your insights into its practices, show you know how this discipline works. You can highlight relevant working experience that, we, that we've talked about, so this super curricular elements, these experiences you, you've engaged in, but use that to offer reflection points, not just that you've done these things, but what you've gained from doing them that adds to your strength as a candidate. So overall, you're trying to build up this convincing and coherent narrative of strengths that take you through relevant to the course of study and finish with this really powerful conclusion that will make someone remember you at the end of the day. You can identify activities related to the subject you're applying for that aren't solely academic. That shows you as a, a rounded individual and not just someone who's solely focused on study. I know the study is really important and it should dominate, but you want to show you're bringing something, something else and something that will enrich what you can offer and contribute during your time. And then extracurricular interests, you can bring those in but relate them to the skills that you've developed through them, as I mentioned. So the roughly um, six broad areas that you want to cover, um, probably, as I say, writing your introduction, your hook, 
and your conclusion probably last once you've got the rest in place. So that's the what. Let's talk a little bit about the how and how you go about writing um, this kind of this kind of thing. So I think the uh, an overall suggestion would be to give yourself lots of time. This doesn't necessarily mean that you will spend months constantly writing it or hours constantly writing it, but writing it over a, a longer period of time will allow you to think between that, to think of things that you'd not thought of at the start that might strengthen it and that you can then add in. It also means you're not writing it under pressure. You're more likely to strengthen it and refine it as you go. Um, it may seem obvious, but looking at some examples will give you a really good idea of how other people have written these things. It will also give you a sense of what 4,000 characters actually looks like, um, because it's probably not an awful lot, really. But it will give you an idea of some of the phrasings people use, the sentence structures, specific words, and how you get a sense of how people are writing that creates this convincing narrative. Obviously, it's important not to copy what you read from other examples, but it gives you an idea of how people write these compelling narratives that you might be able to take forward and relate to your course, to yourself, to your strengths that you can offer. So when you've had a look at some, with in mind the course of study that you're applying for, make a list of everything about you that you think is relevant. Don't worry about structure. Don't worry about anything else. Just get the ideas down um, and use whatever tools are useful for that, whether it's um, um, digitally or on paper, um, mind map kind of thing, whatever helps. Uh, don't throw that away because you might want to come back to that. And when you've got them all down, group them together. You will probably at that point have way more than you can include in your statement, but that's good because then that means you're only putting in the things that are really, really strong when you are actually writing it. So when you've got those groups, start trying to turn your list into sentences because as, as we said, it's important you're not just listing, I've done this, 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 and this. You need to write about what you've done why you've done it and what you've gained from it. So starting to put those into sentences, you may also start to see these ideas go together and other ways to organize it so that it's that strong um, ideas that are coming forward and why they're relevant. Now you will probably continue to edit it. That's a starting point of a draft. But once you've got it in a, in a rough prose format, read it through and think to yourself, does it make sense, first of all, and is it convincing? You can play devil's advocate with yourself. Would you give yourself a place? Um, and how could you make it stronger, ultimately? This is not to judge yourself harshly, but to help yourself to improve it. Think about what's missing. It's probably way too long at this point. You've probably got lots in there. Don't worry at this point about your character count. You make sure you've allowed time for editing it down. So if anything's missing, add it in. And if anything isn't really pulling its weight, anything isn't as strong as you feel it could be, either strengthen it or take it out. And you will only know what's best to do there. It's this essence of getting you as a strong candidate down on the page. You are, of course, the best person to write that and to know what needs to be in there. When you think you've got all of the content in there, start trying to edit it down. Every character needs to earn its place. If something isn't strong enough, strengthen it or take it out. If you, if you feel you want all of the content in, start playing around with, with different words. Um, use a thesaurus, identify synonyms where you, it's a character count, not a word count. So use shorter words in some cases. Also, perhaps thinking about your use of adjectives to, to make points stronger. They can really help to, to, um, to state something more strongly, but you might want to consider using them wisely rather than lots of them. And then when you feel you've got that roughly down, um, go away from it for a little bit. Give it some space. You'll continue to think about it and then come back to it. Read it through again 
and repeat it from the top um, uh, and reflect on yourself again, not to judge it harshly, but to see where it can be improved. So then you've done the hard work. You've got it all down there. It's just reviewing and making it as strong as it can be. So check those first and final sentences are really strong. Are, th are they really creating the first and final impressions that you want? Are they really hooking and leaving those positive points in, your, in people's minds? Um, I think one point to say is that we can often be quite modest when we try and write about what we can each offer and identify our strengths. But if you don't put those strengths down, the person reading it will not know. Um, we spoke to someone the other day who said their daughter was quite good at maths. Um, and then as the conversation continued, we realized that she was actually really very good at maths and had a number of things that could evidence that. But if those evidence points aren't put in there, the person reading it cannot know that. And so you've got to give them the basis to know that you're strong. At various points when you're writing this, but particularly when you're getting to, to this point, it's really important to seek constructive but critical feedback. So seek this from people whose opinion you trust and who you value, but ensure that they will... When I say be critical, I don't mean to criticize you, but to engage within it away, in a way that, again, can make it stronger. So they're really identifying points that could be, that could be strengthened. Um, and make sure that you don't give it to people who will just say, that's really good. You want, you want to use this as an opportunity to improve it. But it might be helpful to give you, the people giving you feedback some pointers if there are particularly things that you, you're not sure about or some elements on which you'd appreciate feedback so that they can focus on that. So first of all, do they understand what you're trying to say might be useful? Um, and if they don't, how, is there any way it could be improved? And also because if you're getting feedback from someone who knows you, they might be able to say if there's something that they know about you that isn't in there that perhaps should be. Whereas again, someone reading it in university wouldn't know that. So that might be a helpful point they can offer to you. And then once you think you've got that there, you've edited it down, really do give yourself time to read it through thoroughly for mistakes. You may also want to get someone else's um, eye over it to read it. When we've written something and read it lots of times, we tend to read what we expect to see. And we don't always see any mistakes that are in there. So having someone else look over it could be really helpful. And of course, if there are a number of you writing this, perhaps sharing them around for that proofread could be, could be a useful use of everybody's time and a supportive procedure. So a sort of lasting point in terms of the personal statement then, we've talked about the actual writing of it um, and how, how it might be useful to go about it. But also thinking at this point in terms of what might you include in that list of ideas, the things that you can offer your strengths to put in this application and have a think now, is there anything missing that you either could show that you do, you engage with, that you could join? Is there anything else that you could do between now and when you need to apply that might mean you've got something stronger to write about when you're at that point? So are there opportunities? Are there related to your interests and without overwhelming what you've already got to do otherwise? Are there things that you could do or join or support others in that mean you, you've got those skills and you've got those strengths that you can then convincingly write about when you get to that point. And again, it's important that through that you can show understanding and you can show engagement and not just interest. Interest is important. It's a really important starting point. But to make this strong, you need to act on that interest and show you've done something with it. That was a lot. Um, I don't know if we've got a minute or so for questions or we can come back at the end.
혹시 질문이 있으세요? Uh, well, maybe I'm sorry, I can't give you some kind of more explanation about things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 자기 소개서에 대해서 제가 잠깐만 좀 소개해 드리려고 <웃음> Thank you very much. Sorry. <웃음> Sorry. 그래 자기 소개서가 어떤 건지 어떻게 구성을 해야 되는지 왜 그다음에 어떤 식으로 좀 체크를 해야 되는지 왜 이런 부분에 대해서 세심하게 좀 얘기를 했던 것 같아요. 그래서 혹시라도 이 부분이 필요하면 제가 자료 영상을 녹화할 테니까 또 드리고 그렇게 할게요. 근데 기본적으로 자기 소개서는 너무 너무 중요해요. 그래서 모든 학교가 자기 소개서 쓰면 다 본다라고 생각을 하시면 돼요. 그리고 깊숙이 본다. 그리고 생각을 하면서 본다라고 생각을 해야 돼요. 그래서 어떤 제가 제 학생들은 대부분 자기 소개서 보거든요. 근데 정말 한 줄도 못 쓰는 사람이 있어요. 한 줄도 필요하지 않는 사람이 있어요. 왜냐하면 미국식으로 적는 거죠. 그러니까 과거에 뭐 됐고 어떻게 태어났고 어떻게 하고 왜 이렇게 이걸 요구하는 게 아니거든요. 이 영국에서 요구하는 자기 소개서는 그 전공에 대해서 나만이 가지고 있는 독특한 열정은 뭐냐 뭐 이런 것들이거든요. 그러니까 대학에서 이렇게 그 다음에 얘기했지만 사천 캐릭터거든요. 문자 하나 세서 사천 자거든요. 그러니까 한 오백 자이 정도밖에 안 되거든요. 사백 자 오백 자 A4 한 장밖에 안 되거든요. 거기에 내 백그라운드 다 넣을 수가 없어요. 그러니까 전공에 대한 열정만 필요한 거예요. 네가 왜이 전공에 관심 있냐? 네 전공 그냥 우리 학교에 이 전공 왜 관심 있냐 이거거든요. 근데 그쪽에서 보고 보는 건 우리 학교 들어오기에 충분히 퀄리파이 됐다. 이런 걸 보는 게 아니라 이 사람이 예를 들면 의대에 관심 있어. 이코노미스트에 관심 있어. 라고 하면 이 사람이 의사가 되고 이코노미스트가 되는데 지금 이 사람이 충분한 스킬을 가지고 있느냐. 이걸 보는 거야. 이해되시죠? 그래서 전공에 대해서 무조건 포커스를 맞춰야 된다. 그리고 아까 25%는 다른 부분, 그죠? 엑스트라 커리큘러, 뭐 운동이라든지 뭐 이런 건 넣어도 되거든요. 이 부분은 밸런스를 그죠? 어떻게 유지하는지 왜 이런 걸 보는 거고요. 그 다음에 다른 어스펙트를 좀 보는 거죠. 이걸 통해 가지고 그다음 이것만 계속 알고 있는 이게 한 가지만 관심 있는 사람이 아니라 다른 부분, 예를 들면 뭐 팀워크라든지. 그죠? 뭐 운동이를 같이 한다든지 팀워크라든지 그런 것도 그 다음에 스트레스를 좀 극복한다고 라 하면 음악을 듣는다든지 왜 이런 것들을 밸런스 때문에 하는 거예요. 아시겠죠? 그래서 간단히 그렇게 좀 소개해드리고요. 그 다음에 <웃음> sorry. 그래서 그 다음에 다음 분 소개해드릴게요. 이분은 그 닥터 랜달 저 페리시고요. 그리고 이분이 임페리얼 대학교에서 오신 분이고요. 제가 앞서 설명해드렸던 프로에드하고 GSTC 파운더이기도 하고요. 그 다음에 이분은 컴퓨터 사이언스 미래 컴퓨터가 어떤 영향을 미치는지 이 부분에 대해서 얘기를 해드릴 거예요. 그래서 내용에서 약간 양자 컴퓨터 나오고 하는데 어렵게 설명하진 않을 거예요. 양자 컴퓨터 지금 우리가 쓰고 있는 컴퓨터라든지 휴대폰이라든지 그것보다 훨씬 앞선 컴퓨터가 이미 가지고 있는 거고요. 그래서 미래에 어떻게 발전하는지 그 다음에 그 뭐, 그죠? 채 GPT? 왜 이런 것들? 그 다음에 우리가 뭐 지금 웨어러블 기기? 왜 이런 것들에 대해서 좀 설명을 해 드릴 거예요. 그리고 여기에서 고라고 나오는데 고가 그 일본어로 바둑을 얘기하는 거거든요. 그래서 우리는 익숙한 알파고가 있죠. 알파고에 대한 얘기를 하니까 왜 이런 용어만 좀 이렇게 하면 그렇게 내용 어렵지 않고 좀 쉬운 내용으로 좀 얘기를 했거든요. 그래서 많이 도움이 될것 같고요. 또 임페리얼 대학에 대해서 설명해 드릴 겁니다. 오케이? <웃음> 안녕하세요. 그다음에 관심 있는 게 컴퓨터 사이언스거든요. 그래서 컴퓨터 사이언스에 대해서 좀 얘기를 할게요. 오케이. 음. So, a quick summary of what I'm going to go through. Um, and I'll give you a little bit more background about myself and um, some of the questions when uh, or some of the slides when we get up to Imperial College. Um, I'll actually uh, try to fit some interview questions in if you think that you would like me to. Okay. Um, this is a little bit about myself. Um, one of the things that I'm involved in is that you have the brochures for is pro-ed. And the interest that I have in that and also the global space design challenge is really education. Um, I'm a scientist by training. 
Um, I have done some computer things in the past. I originally programmed computers way back when the computer room, uh, the computer was as big as this room, and you did punch cards, and you got on an answer. And now this is much, much more powerful than those old computers. So things are evolving fast. Um, <clears throat> but I'm really interested in education. Um, um, I've written one paper called The Theory of Knowledge, which is about constructivist uh, teaching techniques. And I hesitate to use the word teaching because what we really want to do is facilitate students to learn, uh, to learn on their own. And these programs like ProEd and the Global Space Design Challenge and the charity that I work on here um, is all based on that concept of wanting students to learn rather than being taught. Um, <clears throat> whoops, I went the wrong way, sorry. Um, <laughs> so there's the, this is a, a page from the brochure that you have on ProEd. Um, so you can all look at that uh, on your own. Um, if you need to and want to, there's two websites. Um, that you can look up to get more information about both the um, <clears throat> the Global Space Design Program. Uh, this website is for the Space Science Engineering Environmental Foundation, uh, which does the Global Space Design Program. Also, it does several other programs in the U.S. Or, or excuse me, we're doing them in the U.S. in the future, but right now we're doing them in the U.K. Um, <clears throat> those programs are uh, um, space settlement design, um, um, also environmental design competitions, and for younger students, galactic challenges and uh, eco meets. Um, and some of those we're actually starting to do in, in uh, China at the moment, uh, and they will be coming to Southeast Asia, and if anybody's interested, eventually Korea. Um, Pro-Ed, the Global Space Design Challenge, the Environmental Design Challenge, all support the charity, which is um, the SSEF. And for those of you that have students, and I know there's um, some here in the UK um, at OIC, uh, they're free to enter these programs that are put on by the Space Science Engineering Foundation. There's no cost. They're open programs to everybody. <clears throat> um, so this is a little bit about the GSDC. Um, it's for 15 to 18 year old students. It's an industry simulation. Um, it was based on the concept of what really happens like at NASA in the United States. Um, different companies are given a request for proposal and they submit in a presentation uh, to NASA um, the results of their research in doing that proposal. <clears throat> um, the students organize into companies. They elect their own officers. They have their own engineering staff. Uh, adults are there to supervise them. They do it much like they would do at NASA. They have red teams of adults that go along just to check to see how the students are doing, but it's all students' own work, not, not adult input. There's no teaching involved at all. It, and they do learn a lot um, after they go through that process. Um, Imperial College, I'll let you read this, and while you're looking at it, I might talk a little bit about interviews. Um, the interview procedure at Oxford and Cambridge is substantially different than Imperial College and the other G5 universities. Um, the, um, not all departments actually even hold an interview. Um, so if you're interested in a topic and, it's, and you don't speak well to people or respond well, um, you might choose a department that doesn't have an interview. Um, and, but most of them do. Um, the, if you get an interview at Imperial College, uh, you have a very high probability of getting a place and make, getting an offer at the university. Uh, it's quite different at Oxford and Cambridge. Um, they're there to see how you think. Um, um, and you're going to be interviewed by different people, not just a person that's in the department interviewing all of the students. A lot of times you're going to have tutors, uh, professors that are actually uh, going to be working with you, and they want to know if they want to work with you. And you get also to decide uh, if you want to work with them. So never think 
when you uh, talk to students or the ones of you that are students here, um, an interview is both them interviewing you, but there's also a little bit about you interviewing them. You want to make sure that you really want to be there. Um, so Imperial College is um, fairly large, has 125 countries. I think I said a different number earlier. Um, it has the highest concentration of high impact research um, in the UK. And that pretty much uh, also is in the United States and the world. It has a very, uh, it's very research intensive. Um, so it's technical science, technology, engineering, medicine, but also business uh, school. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, one thing that we'll talk about later is Imperial College is um, spread out and throughout London through 13 different hospitals. Uh, they're all large hospitals, they're the primary hospitals in London, uh, Chelsea, Westminster, the Royal Free. Um, so there's a very large medical component to Imperial College. Um, and as I said earlier, there's also a lot of um, um, non-British um, students. Um, I think in my department, which is earth science and engineering, uh, it's at least 35%. Um, and if you, when we get to medical, it's slightly different because there's a limit on how many foreign students can actually go to medical school. Uh, it's a 7.5% of the um, of the applicants um, can be foreign students. Otherwise, the rest are, are in the UK. Um, <clears throat> so, as I said, it's, um, it's in science, technology, engineering, medicine, business, but it's in a really nice area in London. Next to Hyde Park, you have Albert Hall, um, the Natural History Museum, which is one of the better ones in the world. Victoria and Albert are all within just um, three to four minutes walk of uh, where my office is in Imperial. And so I really love the area. It's a great, great area. And if you're interested in shopping, it's about a 10 minute walk to Harrods. Um, and there's uh, a lot of um, great shopping of all of the designer stores and stuff. But um, so this is, we'll get to the, uh, how many of you are interested in uh, artificial intelligence? Anybody want to raise a hand? <laughs> so this, will, yeah, okay. Uh, how about computers in general? Other than other than using this computer, now everybody has one of these here. I'll wager. Um, so anyway, well, maybe uh, it'll be a good experience for everybody. Uh, AI is going to permeate our lives uh, in the future. It's um, we've all. Um, seen how computers have changed things, laptops, cell phones, um, biometrics, um, everything is quickly moving um, in that field. And artificial intelligence has only played a small part up to this point. Um, if you look at regular computers, um, laptops, obviously, and that's my laptop as I was preparing this talk yesterday morning. Um, and this is a, a supercomputer. Um, the supercomputer uh, can take up a lot of space, and there's some interesting parts about computing. Uh, you can build these massive computers that are very fast, but they still have one issue. They're linear. They use bits just like the phone does, just like the laptop does. Um, this is a quantum computer. Um, it's, a, it's a computer of the future, although they are functioning and producing results right now. Uh, that computer uh, is actually quite small. Uh, the computer itself is only needs to be about this big. Um, but it takes up quite a bit of space because it needs super cooling. So the environment around the computer is quite a bit larger. Um, so the question is, though, is what does a computer, like a quantum computer, actually do and how is it organized? Um, it's, it's a bit complicated. It's based on quantum mechanics, superposition. Um, it, if you know about the um, box experiment with Schrodinger's cat, um, if you have a closed box and a cat inside, you don't actually know if the cat is alive or not alive until you open the box. It can, in the point of quantum mechanics is it can be in either state, and you don't know until it's observed. 
Um, quantum computing works along the same way with qubits. Um, the difference is, is that as you add qubits um, <clears throat> to it, it exponentially increases in power. So um, it goes by, say, power of 10. It gets 100 times bigger than 1,000 times and then a million times bigger if you add a qubit. Um, a regular computer is limited because it's a linear um, um, addition. You had code based on binary code. Um, and you just keep adding that and expanding it on. Um, but it's um, um, much less powerful than computing, than quantum computers will be. <clears throat> um, and we're probably talking about things like, right now, uh, we can't break crypto systems like government cryptography. Uh, but quantum computers will probably quite easily be able to break those kinds of systems because they can process so much data. And in a short period of time. Um, some of the things that are important in computing in general are uh, blockchain, which probably everybody's heard about um, in finance. Um, artificial intelligence, which is the main thing that we're going to talk about after this. Robotics. Uh, CRISPR. Does everybody know what CRISPR is? It's a, it's a DNA technique for analyzing uh, and modifying uh, DNA. Um, it's going to materially change the medical profession. Um, I mean, we're looking at things now like um, we can do our ancestry with DNA and stuff, but we're actually going to be able to specifically look at the medicines that we take based on not everybody's DNA, but our own personal DNA. So everything will be targeted and tailored, but you can also with CRISPR, adjust your DNA. So if you um, are subject to a particular disease, you may be able to alter that and fix it with CRISPR. Um, the cloud, I think everybody knows about. Um, quantum computing, uh, we've talked a little bit about, and that's all we'll really say about that. Um, so what is artificial intelligence? Um, it's a smart software and hardware that is able to perform tasks that typically uh, have required humans. So the big difference is, is we all know that this phone and our laptops are not as smart as we are about solving problems, being creative. Um, but with artificial intelligence, um, um, they will be. I say that with a great deal of both um, um, pessimism and optimism because I uh, frankly have some worries about what happens when artificial intelligence entities uh, have the capability that we do and they have access to the world of data, uh, what's going to happen at that point. Um, so one of the early tests, um, I'll start with a little bit of history going back is artificial intelligence has been around as a concept since the mid 50s. So it's not a new concept but it really didn't go anywhere until about 2015 in the case of the Go match 2016. Uh, <clears throat> Deep Minds is a company in the UK uh, that really started promoting a concept called deep learning. And it's a, it's a bit of a funny term because we go deep learning. What does that mean? It's, it's actually got a technical side to it, uh, but it doesn't sound like it. It sounds like just deep. Um, that we're going to dive in deep and do learning. But that's what the artificial intelligence um, machine will do. Um, in 2016, um, Google um, had designed an AI computer to compete in Go. Um, and <clears throat> Lee Sedol, who was the champion then, I think is he Chinese? Does anybody know? Yeah. Um, oh, yes. OK. Anyway. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> um, anyway, Lisa Dahl uh, had a match with Google's um, artificial intelligence machine, and he lost. It astounded everybody that, that a human could actually lose uh, to, to a machine. Um, so, you know, it's a, how much, um, um, how many moves are there in Go. Does anybody know? It's, it's a really, really big number. Um, it's a million, trillion, 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 trillion. 
um, the number of moves possible are 10 to the 360th. Now, to give you an idea of scale, the number of atoms in the universe is 10 to the 80th, which is a very, very big number. They're huge numbers. So the thing is, is if you were doing uh, a computer that wanted to compete in something that is complex as Go, um, <clears throat> you would have to have a massive computer that worked in linear ways, and it would take a long time because what it would be trying to do is analyze every single possible move. So Lee Sedol makes a move, uh, the computer looks at every possible outcome, and there's a huge amount of them. Uh, it would not be possible for a regular computer. Um, uh, I see Andre shaking his head over there, wondering about that number 10 to the 360th. Uh, it's a very big number, <laughs> there's no doubt. And um, so it wouldn't be possible to program a computer to, to do that, a regular computer, a quantum computer or um, someone, some, a, a AI computer can do that. AI does not work in a linear fashion. It will not just have to assess every single move. Um, so it's, it's much, much better. Um, everybody's probably heard of um, chat GPT now, I'm sure. Um, and um, has everybody used it here? Anybody used it? Okay, a few nods and stuff. Um, I've tried it, I've asked it for all kinds of different things. I asked it to write a book. I thought, I, I write novels for fun, and I thought, okay, I'm gonna be pretty useless writing a novel in the future when I can have a computer do it in a matter of a half a second or a millisecond. And so um, I asked ChatGP to, to outline chapters, and then I asked it to start writing chapters. When it wrote a short chapter, I said, no, I'd like a little more detail than that. I'd like, um, you know, 2,000 words instead of 250 words. Right back, I got an answer right back. It's pretty amazing, and it's, and it's um, good. So eventually, these AI programs are just in their infancy right now. Yet we're already starting to be impacted by them. One of the areas, and for your, is it son or daughter that's at OIC? Okay. Um, one of the areas that's really going to material effect is going to be medicine. Um, so I put a slide up here. This is a space settlement, one of the ones that we do in the space settlement design competitions, um, which I'll say for. Um, a, a settlement requires not only engineering and architecture, but it requires um, medical, uh, government, security, all kinds of things. So a settlement is good for all different areas of students and their learning. Um, <clears throat> so that's what we do with the Global Space Design Challenge and also the Charity Space Design Challenges um, in the UK, and also Galactic Challenge, which is for nine to 14 year olds. Uh, Yasmin's son just participated in one uh, as he just turned 10, and I think was quite excited about it. Um, so something we're all faced with now is facial recognition. Um, it's um, something that we see every place. I look at my phone, I can sign on with facial recognition. Um, so that's one of the things that's progressing along, that's changing our lives now. Um, there's agriculture. Now, I don't know how many of you would have thought about this, but um, once upon a time in my past life, and somebody says you've done several things, but I say I'm old, so of course I've done several things, um, was I owned a ranch. Uh, I've, I raised hay for animals, llamas, um, cattle, and other things, and I used to spend hours to get up at five o'clock in the morning, get on a tractor, and go around squares around the field. Uh, either planting, cutting, or, or harvesting hay. Um, and then there's also spraying chemicals. You don't need to do that anymore. Uh, John Deere tractors have programmed the tractors. They go out by themselves and you just say, here's the map of the field, and it goes around the field all day and the farmer doesn't have to sit on the tractor. The same thing would go with um, spraying. You can <clears throat> use drones to go around and spray your crops. Um, an area that I was in raised apples. Um, when there was a frost, the apples um, would freeze. So 
Another thing that I've done that maybe Osman doesn't even know about is they used to have a helicopter, fly helicopters, which I actually love, but they are a little dangerous, I have to admit, if you do it too, too often. Uh, but they used to, I uh, used to take the helicopter and go to the apple orchard when the frost set in and would just hover all around the orchard to beat the air so that you stir up the air and you don't get the fruit killed by the frost. Um, we all know what's happening in factories. Um, years and years ago, I visited a Ford factory and I was amazed that it was all of these robotic machines building the cars and very few people. Um, but another area that's going to be really impact us is education. Um, I would say the two primary things that are going to impact us in the near term are going to be medicine and education. Um, the, so we already talked about this, but why, why medicine and why education? Because now doctors train and they get good training, but they deal with a lot of people. So they're not dealing with just you as an individual when you come in. When you go to the office, it seems so, but they're treating, they're treating you as part of a mass group of people. Um, so in the future, you're going to have um, medicines dedicated to you, uh, to your particular gene profile. Um, uh, they're gonna have um, robots doing your surgeries. Um, I'm rather surprised that even today, we have almost 25% of all procedures and operations are either done by or assisted by robots. Um, and it makes sense, you think about it. A human, um, maybe you don't want a doctor to go in and go in for a surgery the next morning, have a doctor that was out partying the night before and be a little bit shaky. A robot can be very precise in what they do. Um, so these are the four areas we're going to take a very quick look at. Um, um, so home, personal things. We're just now starting to get some of that effect. I mean, like at the hotel I was staying, there was a, a robotic machine sitting there that said delivery machine. There's no reason for a person to come from the kitchen and deliver your breakfast up to a room when the robot can open the elevator, take it up to the room, and knock on the door and deliver your breakfast. Uh, there's obvious vacuum cleaners, even just in the last year or so, we've started to see um, cleaning machines rolling around airports. Um, you know, and I've, I jump in front of them on purpose just to see how alert they are, um, but they have no problem with that. They can work through the crowds, continue to do their job, and do it 24 hours a day. Um, so, Eventually, all of these different machines are going to help us. Uh, is, is there a real reason to cook? Um, well, some of us like to cook. I'm not one of them, but some of you probably do. But you can have um, your robot in your kitchen do your cooking for you. So medical, the area that we've already briefly touched on, um, <clears throat> assessing diseases and assessing what you have as a problem can be done quite well by computers today, but AI is going to make that uh, really a slick operation. Um, back even as much as 20 years ago, when phones were still just in their infancy, uh, GPs had programs that they could put in and say, here's, here's six symptoms. Uh, what do you think I'm looking for as a disease or a problem? And unfortunately, uh, as much as we need medicine, medicine is not a science. Um, it's um, a doctor says, well, you have a pain here. It's probably this, I'll give you this pill. If that doesn't work, I'll give you another one. And if that doesn't work, maybe we'll have to do some analysis like um, um, an MRI and see what we see there and then try to figure it out. So, but it's not exactly a science like science works. Um, so finding out what's wrong with you, then treating you, then treating you in the hospital uh, with a robotic system if you need something like that. Um, it's all going to be part of the future of medicine. Doctors uh, doing um, what they're doing now is going to be a thing of the past. Um, for the most part, doctors will be the human 
relation between the patient explaining to them what's going on, but the AI will probably diagnose what you need and treat you and prescribe that treatment. Um, there's a thought that just probably now, and it's a guess, that the artificial programs tailored to use an individual will expand the lifetime by about 20 years. Um, and of course, that's just a guess, but nobody knows. Um, <clears throat> so this slide is a little spooky to me some way. It's, I mean, what if there's a flaw in the computer that's running this robot when he's deciding to slice you open and work on you? Um, and naturally, they're not showing a, a human sitting there or laying there um, for this. But um, so in education, um, this is a pretty standard idea. We have a meta right now putting out new um, virtual reality eyepieces. Um, it, it hasn't taken um, um, the fancy of everybody yet, like it probably will. Um, it's, um, you have to put on the device, you have to buy it, it's kind of expensive. Um, but think about if you're an architect and you design a building, uh, you can put your goggles on and you can actually walk through that building and you can go up the elevator and you can walk around the floors, you can look at the view, you can see everything that's going on. And in education, uh, that's probably going to be used, but probably even more important um, with, I'm going to go back, sorry. Um, in education, we'll be having a personal friend that's an artificial intelligence entity uh, that can talk to you, um, actually be there and, and look like an entity, and that they will read the student. What do they like? How are they reacting to things? How are they learning? Um, and you'll be having to have a dialogue back and forth. Um, so it can be very personalized. Um, so the artificial intelligence entity is constantly learning, and that's what it does. The, an artificial intelligence program was developed, um, and then they ask it to say, I want you to compete in chess. It took it four hours to learn how to become a chess master. Now, I know that I can't learn to be a chess master, if I ever could, in, in that amount of time. So um, it's really quite interesting. The, the next area that it's going to affect us in all and is in finance. And we're starting to see that now. Banks are closing. Um, things are online. I don't go to the bank anymore. I only use my phone. I used to use my laptop, and more recently, I've migrated to phone, and I'm sure many of you have done the same thing. Um, <clears throat> but it's going to do um, a lot more for banking institutions than that. Um, there was a group, I recall, that went to Las Vegas that designed this. I'll, I'm going to beat the Las Vegas um, machine in playing blackjack. So I'm going to do. I'm going to go to Las Vegas and I'm going to come out with a pocket full of money. Well, they they had uh, ways they use their toes and their shoes to manipulate it and then communicate the data to themselves. And in fact, you can beat blackjack. It's a statistical game. So that group of people were immediately hired by a bank to do what? To trade stocks in milliseconds, and most banks do that and rely on it. Now, if you trade stocks, um, you find that you're not competing against a lot of other individuals, you're competing against computers. Um, so they're buying, selling like this all day long, and sometimes they win and sometimes they lose, When, but the whole object is, is that they end up selecting things that are going up more than they buy things that are going down when they come out with money in the bank at the end of the day. So there's um, blockchain, um, you know, a way of verifying things, which um, most banks are starting to really look at. Uh, so it's going to have a major impact, as there probably won't be many bricks and mortar banks left. Um, out there. I know I can't hardly find one in London anymore. I go, there's a cash machine, the rest of the bank is closed off. Um, so um, I'll say thank you very much for listening there. And if you have any questions, we're going to do them later. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Okay, well, thank you very much.
<웃음> 감사합니다. 그래요. 지금 AI에 대해서 지금 제 학생 중에 그런 약간 좀 일화가 있어가지고 잠깐만 얘기해드리면 제 학생 중에 컴퓨터 사이언스를 하고 있는 친구가 있거든요. 그런데 여름에 그 인턴십을 하거든요. 7월, 8월 그때 많이 하거든요. 그래서 제가 좀 추천도 많이 해주는데 골드만삭스에서 일을 한다는 거예요. 2개월 동안. 아니 컴퓨터 사이언스인데 왜 골드만삭스에서 일해? 라고 했거든요. 근데 이런 프로그램이라든지 사고 팔고 뭐 이런 것들이 되게 많이 있는 거죠. 우리도 다 금융거래를 다 모바일 폰으로 하는 것처럼. 그래서 그 얼마 정도 버는지 물어봤거든요. 그래서 무료로 하는 거지 그죠? 한 물어봤는데 한 달에 500만 원 정도로 본대요. 그래서 아 그렇게 가는 이유가 있구나. 왜 그렇게 생각했던 것 같아요. 지금 아르바이트 하는 정도인데 예, 아시겠죠? 그래서 아무튼 컴퓨터 사이언스는 어, 지금 현재 공부하고 있는 친구도 다섯 명 OIC, 총 여섯 명 있는데 그 중에서 두 명이 의대 정도 의대를 간다고 했다가 컴퓨터 사이언스를 또 바꿨거든요. 그리고 그건 사실은 OIC 독특한 프로그램 때문에 그러긴 하는데 워크 이스프레스를 해야 되고 왜 그걸 줘야 되는지 알아야 되고 뭐 이런 부분이 있긴 하는데 그죠? 그 부분은 이제 야스민이 좀 해줄 것 도와드릴 거예요. 야스민, 우리 가 이거 공부해 봐요. Some break, so we have in a sandwich or juice and something. So we be ten or fifteen. Yeah. Okay. <웃음> okay. 아 uh, 지금 그 약간 15분 정도 그죠? 제가 좀 준비한 게좀 있거든요. 제가 좀 드릴게요. 그래서 음료수하고 샌드위치하고 뭐뭐 뭐, 뭐가 포함이 됐는지 잘 모르겠는데 좀 드릴게요. 그리고 나서 야스민한테 마이크를 넘길게요. 네, 감사합니다.